Does this thing work? Hello. I'm assuming it does. Hello. How are you today? I am good. I have decided to stream today. If you want to call it that, I'm basically talking to myself. I don't think anyone's watching. This is good practice in case I want to do something else, which I'm not sure, which is why I'm doing this. I've been thinking a lot about what to call this if I decided to, to actually, you know, advertise it or try to get other people to actually watch it because I enjoy doing it. I've decided I enjoy doing it. I have some other projects that I'm working on that I also enjoy, so it's still just a project. However, I don't really know how to define this because if I just leave it as Curious Gypsy, yes, that's, that's pretty much my identity. That's how I feel. I am a gypsy. I've moved so much in the last 20 years. I'm from Canada. I've moved to the States. I've lived almost everywhere in the... Well, I haven't lived almost everywhere in the States. I've almost traveled to everywhere in the States. I've lived in many different... In different states. I've lived in Florida. I've lived in Nevada. I've lived in Washington State. I've lived in Ohio. I don't know. Anyway, many places. More than that, actually. Um, but this this specific kind of program, or whatever you want to call it, experience of just me learning stuff and enjoying myself talking to the void. Um, I don't know if Curious Gypsy is right as a title for that, so I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm thinking about something like Be Real With Me or something. I don't really know. But it, uh, Deep Conversations with Curious Minds, it's too long. It's kind of how I feel that this this is really just kind of encapsulates that because it is about learning, but it's also kind of conversations that I say to my, I would say them to myself and I just feel like, um, this information or this, the topics that I talk about are very important topics that had to be, that should be, maybe they are being had by everyone. And, um, and I just want to add my voice to that conversation and I want to make myself heard because I feel I feel that that's important to say what you believe and um, I do feel that the emphasis that I see around me still is is not what I would like to see for culture and that's just me anyway I am doing very well today I went for a walk this morning and I haven't gone for a walk in at least three weeks because it's been very cold where I live and this week has been more warm has been like in the 40s and the 50s in the daytime which is really nice and so uh, I like to get exercise every day so I skipped my normal exercise of doing like exercise with no equipment because I don't have any equipment but I need to get in shape and I went for a walk instead Anyway, so that's what I've been up to. Let me see if I can get my fireplace up. I need to see the fire and feel nice and cozy while I do this. See, this is what I'm looking at on the side. It's just a nice, cozy little fireplace. Oops, don't pause play. Okay. And I'm going to, um, I want to read more of this today. I feel like I only read a tiny bit of it yesterday, but, um, I kind of also want to watch this methane in Texas show, but only part of it. I think I'll, I'll watch 10 minutes of it. And then maybe um, next time I'll watch the next 10 minutes, and then the next time I'll watch the next 10 minutes. The Tempest Upon Texas. Over the it past two years, a deadly freeze. Freezing rain on top of already impassable roads. Record rainfall and floods. Within a matter of like 10 minutes, the place is filled with water. Scorching heat followed by raging wildfires. People here in Carbon, Texas are picking up what's left of their community after an overnight fire destroyed much of their city. 
I've lost everything. Texas is home to some of the most extreme weather in North America. Is it coincidence or can we point to something else? Mother Nature's awesome fury or are we in Texas the co-authors of our own tragic tale? Drilling rigs, they're cropping up again all over the state of Texas. Great news for producers and operators and to the economy. Folks who live next door, they see it more as just a nuisance. But what they can't see is what we all should be worried about. Methane or leaking natural gas superheating the planet. And one of the worst spots in the world for it, right here in Texas. <laughs> Texas, the oil and gas mecca, not only of the United States, but we are the fourth highest producer of fossil fuel in the world. Here in the Permian Basin, a stretch of land covering 75,000 miles in West Texas, beneath the ground sits the largest oil reserve in the United States. More drilling occurs here than in any place in the country. But according to Climate Trace, a consortium of independent researchers studying greenhouse gas pollution around the world, the Permian Basin is by far and away the largest single source of pollution on the planet. What? At a distant number two, an oil and gas field in Russia. The war in Ukraine, combined with a post-pandemic spike in fuel consumption, has put renewed pressure on oil and gas producers in Texas. The state must produce more to meet demand, meaning more stress on aging infrastructure and more methane and toxic byproducts billowing into the sky. Methane, for example, can warm the climate system with about, about 100 times more strength than the same amount of carbon dioxide. Gita Prasad is a climate scientist at UT Austin, just one of many from around the globe studying the harmful effects of methane gas. While CO2 emissions have a more long-lasting effect, she says methane leaking from oil and gas facilities is many times worse. She says together they are the main contributors to really? climate change. So we really don't want this methane escaping anywhere in our supply chain, whether it's directly through these leaks or through flaring that might be converting that methane partially into carbon dioxide, entirely into carbon dioxide, or not at all. All of those are bad outcomes from a climate perspective. Hmm. The most renowned tracker of methane pollution in Texas, if not the nation, is Sharon Wilson with Oilfield Witness. She's a former senior field advocate for the nonprofit organization Earth. I rewatch that and last has provided part, evidence but... and testimony. I just want to make sure I understand. Warm the climate system with a the byproducts this is important billowing into the sky. Methane, for example, can warm the climate system with about, about 100 times more 100 strength times. than the same amount of carbon dioxide. Gita Prasad is a climate scientist at UT Austin, just one of many from around the globe studying the harmful effects of methane gas. While CO2 emissions have a more long-lasting effect, she says methane leaking from oil and gas facilities is many times worse. She says together, they are the main contributors to climate change. So we really don't want this methane escaping anywhere in our supply chain, whether it's directly through these leaks or through flaring that might be converting that methane partially into carbon dioxide, entirely into carbon dioxide, or not at all. All of those are bad outcomes from a climate perspective. The most renowned tracker of methane pollution in Texas, if not the nation, is Sharon Wilson with Oilfield Witness. She's a former senior field advocate for the nonprofit organization Earthworks and has provided evidence and testimony to NATO and to the EPA. Making some clean energy out here. 
Wilson and her colleagues travel the state with infrared cameras documenting something okay, the maybe human I'll watch eye 15 cannot minutes. see. <laughs> Clouds billowing into this the sky. Really good, right? That's raw methane and affiliated toxins called volatile organic compounds spewing out of vent stacks and storage tanks at oil and gas and processing plants around the state. Wilson is convinced after more than a decade of research, the problem is worse than ever. She says even advanced filtering technology installed by many operators is not helping. Hmm. A few weeks ago, we were in the Permian and we observed 26 sites. All of them were emitting. Of the 26 sites, 14 had observable vapor recovery systems. Of the 14, 100% were failing. And I mean failing in a big way. Wilson often teams up with the nonprofit Environmental Defense Fund. A recent study by the EDF reveals the Permian Basin releases nearly three times more methane than the EPA has previously estimated. 1.4 million metric tons every year. Enough natural gas to meet the needs of nearly two million homes. It is one of the leakiest basins in the United States, um, but what we found is that many oil producing basins do tend to have higher emissions than natural gas emitting, natural gas producing basins. And I think a lot of that problem is, is due to, to flares, particularly in the Permian. The Environmental Defense Fund first began collecting aerial methane data in 2019 and conducted more than 100 flights across the Permian Basin for two years using airplanes and helicopters, documenting methane leaks from thousands of no, wells and production system, facilities. Right? So they would fly over the area, kind of in a lawnmower pattern, and then would actually see the normally invisible methane with their instrument. And they could both visualize the plumes so they could see where, which exact site the oil, the methane was coming from, and quantify the emission rate. Um, so this approach allowed us to survey thousands of sites very quickly and find many, many large emitters and then send that data to operators and other stakeholders so they could reduce those emissions. The question becomes, if we have the data, what's being done to stop the flow of greenhouse gases? Isn't that always the Texas we has the data. no rules prohibiting methane releases, but the gas what's must be done? burned off or flared, like this. But first, plant operators must obtain a permit from the Texas Railroad Commission, and at that, only limited amounts can be flared. Flaring natural gas is a highly regulated process, most commonly used in crude oil production, in which excess natural gas is burned off at a well site. This reduces pollution and protects public safety by burning flammable gas rather than releasing it into the atmosphere. Flaring the Environmental Defense Fund and Earthworks Texas claim that as much as 84% of the flaring activity in Texas is unpermitted and unchecked. They say state regulators are doing little or nothing to measure how much flaring is going on or how much methane, carbon dioxide, or toxins are being released into the air. Railroad Commission officials declined to comment to Spectrum News about the findings, but it is on record calling the Earthworks analysis flawed and based on incomplete data or inaccurate assumptions. The Environmental Defense Fund says about one in 10 of the flares in the Permian Basin they documented two years ago were malfunctioning and venting methane gas directly into the air. Venting, equipment malfunctioning, there are leaks, there are pipes where they vent gas intentionally. They just release it to the air. The Flares are malfunctioning. There's black carbon going everywhere, smoke. Um, it's, it smells. It's horrible. I mean, there's the hydrocarbon over the entire horizon. Environmental consultant Tim Doty works with Wilson in tracking polluters. He says regulatory oversight is a big problem in Texas, and he would know he was one of the top methane pollution inspectors in the state. And when you when it comes to climate causing gases like methane and 
and carbon dioxide, they have no interest in measuring it at all. In fact, they don't track it. Coming up. But holy moly, you should see the, what's coming out of there. Unchecked toxic and greenhouse emissions. Doty says state regulators are doing little to stop. This is not the exception to the rule. This is the rule. responsible early on the first couple of years uh, doing mobile monitoring work, so air monitoring. We're going on a ride with environmental consultant Tim Doty. He's a former air quality expert with the TCEQ, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, whose job it is to monitor oil and gas pollution in Texas. Doty is taking me on a tour of the oil-saturated rolling plains of Carnes County, southeast of San Antonio and then became the large project leader, which I managed, I don't know, 15 to 20 people. Doty led the state's environmental agency's efforts to police oil and gas polluters for 25 years. He says he left his job in 2018 after it became clear the oil and gas industry, the polluters themselves, had more influence over top regulatory officials than he did. Just looking at this from one angle. Today, Doty is an environmental consultant for Earthworks who still patrols the oil fields looking for polluters using his infrared camera. Well, the camera shows me that the flare on the left over here, the taller one, has is, is uh, you know, constantly, continuously leaking hydrocarbons including methane, which is a greenhouse gas. Is it supposed to be doing that? No. Our first stop is Marathon Oil's East Carnes County Processing Plant, where for the third time in a week, Doty recorded images of multiple flare stacks releasing raw methane into the air. All I know is we have a continuous emission source sitting here that this is not combusted or not combusting. That is not the way that it's supposed to be operating. And the TCQ doesn't appear to be doing its job, right? Because this is just, again, one instance here in Carnes County, right? How many other instances are like this in Carnes County? Then Doty discovers even more methane leaking from fuel storage tanks. The stream up here to the top left, uncombusted hydrocarbon, majority methane. And then we have all these emissions here, right, are coming out of the, see all that movement yeah, along this tank it. wall? See, see all this movement off of that back tank back there? Yeah. All oh hydrocarbon, God. all uncombusted, majority methane. What does that do to the environment? Well, it causes, uh, you know, it's a greenhouse gas. It causes global warming, right, the climate change. Just a few miles away, we stop at another Marathon oil processing plant. The situation is the same. One flare spewing volumes of methane and a taller stack with, at first, only a tiny flame. It is, it, it is, it is lit. Now, it, now it's lit. What do you think just happened there? They got a shot of, they got a shot of pressure and a shot of gas. But holy moly, you should see the, what's coming out of there. Tell me what's coming out of there. That's uncombusted hydrocarbon. And again, an additional inspection reveals more gases escaping from flare stacks and storage tanks all over the property. I mean, it's just out of control, right? Emissions pouring off of this tank battery going from right to left off on the horizon. I mean, not one tank. Not one pressure relief valve. The entire, the entire thing is engulfed in hydrocarbon. 
Just weeks later, Doty filed a complaint with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality against 37 oil and gas processing facilities in three regions. Of the two marathon plants that we visited, Doty alleged hydrocarbon is being emitted continuously under high pressure and emissions are out of control. We asked Marathon Oil to discuss the allegations with us on camera. They declined, but provided a statement saying, Marathon Oil recognizes the impact of greenhouse gas and other air emissions on global climate and air quality. That's why we carry out our operations, prioritizing environmental, social, and okay. governance excellence. The emissions referenced in the complaint are permitted, and during the follow-up inspection performed by the TCEQ, no violations were cited. The TCEQ says it investigated all of Doty's 37 complaints against 23 companies. Their findings resulted in 11 notices of violations, one agreed order to make repairs, and one plant was one. fined. $6,000. Wow, $6,000. Both marathon facilities we visited were not among the violators. Most of Doty's visually documented complaints were either unfounded or resulted in only a warning. I mean, I think it's pathetic, but it's not surprising to many. I mean, I was on the inside of this agency for 28 plus years on the mobile and did the mobile monitoring and managed that program. So I saw a lot of the end results back in those days. And the TCEQ, um, you know, in my opinion, does not have a strong compliance and enforcement program. Spectrum News One reached out to a number of operators to try to get an understanding of the environmental difficulties they face in drilling and processing oil and gas. No one wanted to talk on the record. Jack McDonald, along with Sharon Wilson of Earthworks, co-authored the study, Flaring in Texas, a Comprehensive Government Failure. McDonald says he's not surprised at TCEQ's passive approach to enforcement. It tells me that the violation system that currently exists just is not effective. And I think the reason for that is because the TCEQ and the Railroad Commission have deprioritized fining operators. So oftentimes them getting a violation does little more than just alert them that people are watching them. Uh, it doesn't result in any financial penalties or any real change because there's no motivation. Wow. When okay. we shared that allegation with the TCEQ, they declined to respond. Another facility investigated by Doty, this one outside of Kennedy, Texas, with a history of dozens of complaints, some of them filed by the family living right next door. Our, our faith just stands on God to keep us safe every night, me and him, because you never know. You never know what's coming out of that plant. Their story of sickness and sorrow when we come back. Oh, I guess I watched more than I thought. You'll watch that next time. That looks really good. How disturbing and not surprising, unfortunately. Are you surprised? Watch so many documentaries about oil and gas in Texas and, you know, just lax regulators and stuff. I don't know. I feel like I don't like have a lot of information on it if you ask me I'm, but I just don't like are you really surprised it just seems like people get away with murder these companies you know anyway um, what can be done is you know that's funny that this this only has like look at this Brett ship media even though it's like a news program right that was probably aired on a news channel or something but it doesn't look like it has 423 views what a shame this should be should have a lot more views okay I need my fire back. 
Nope, I guess I can't see. Okay, that's fine. Um, I just want to see this website real quick to go to wherever. Decarbonize the grid is where I was at when I last looked at it. I guess I have to, I have to go back to the next one somehow. Can't go to that one, let's go to tracker. Okay, fix food, we're on fix food. Oh, look at that, farm soil is off course. Fertilizer is off course. Consumption, code red. Hmm. Yeah, that one's gonna be hard to change. I don't think everybody wants to become vegan or eat worms. I have to figure out. I don't think we need to eat quite as much meat in this country though. One point one pounds of beef and three point eight pounds of dairy every week on average per capita. Hmm. Okay. I wanna read a little bit more about the beef thing. Okay. Regenerative beef. Uh Global warming arguments. Maybe I'll just ask Monica. This is old. I don't know. I've heard some. I don't know. Okay. Um, the term regenerative beef global warming arguments refers to the debate surrounding the impact of regenerative agricultural practices on global warming, specifically in relation to beef production. Yes. Regenerative agriculture is a set of farming practices that aim to improve soil health, increase biodiversity, and enhance ecosystem services. Proponents of regenerative agriculture argue that these practices can help mitigate climate change by sequestering carbon in the soil, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and improving water quality. In the context of beef production, regenerative agricultural practices can include minimizing tillage to reduce soil disturbance and pre preserve soil structure using cover crops. Okay, this is all the stuff they said. Integrating livestock into the farming system to promote nutrient cycling and improve soil health, managing grazing to mimic natural grazing patterns. Some studies have suggested, suggested that regenerative agricultural practices can lead to significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and beef and jack production. However, the overall impact of regenerative agriculture on global warming is still a subject. Okay, well, I don't think that there's much of a, an argument against regenerative agriculture myself. That's not what I'm interested in. I just want to know if if it makes a big difference, like if you are going to be eating beef, if you buy regenerative beef, if that, if like, if it can be a significantly less impact. Because if you're going to eat beef, I'm sure a lot of people are going to still eat beef, even though then maybe they won't eat as much, ideally. You would want it to be regenerative. Because then they're eating you know, their natural food sources and things like that as well. It's like all kinds of reasons why regenerative methods of farming are better rather than just buying organic or whatever. Mm -mm. But it's difficult to tell whether something is regenerative unless it's actually labeled as such. So I suppose most of them will be, right? Unless you're buying from a small farm. Some experts argue that while regenerative farming is a possible environmental impacts, its impact on global warming may be limited. I don't think so. Okay, well, of course we have to reduce meat consumption. Okay, well, all of those things are, are obvious things that need to happen. But I think eating less meat is something I'm interested in and, and something that I do already. 
but not not because for any philosophical argument, but largely because I can't afford to buy it and they don't have good meat where I live. Like there's, it's all industrial fed meat or industrial raised meat. And I really do prefer, prefer to buy meat that I know how it was raised. And I know I had a good life. And it's very difficult in our system to be able to t tell those things. So, um, there are options for buying meat online that I have considered, you know, cause you can have it shipped to you with dry ice and stuff, but I don't know. I just can't really afford it right now anyway. So it's not a huge deal. Anyway, let's keep reading. Okay. Um, you know, I swear, where was I yesterday? You think I could just remember to use a stupid bookmark. Okay. I'm pretty sure this is where I left off. Michael Polan. He is so cool. I remember he had like a study about coffee too. He went, he went without coffee for like a month or something and then wrote about it. Or maybe it was longer than that. And, um, it's amazing, um, how much we are addicted and we don't even realize it. Like almost <laughs> so many people on the planet are, can't live without their coffee and they don't even understand that they're actually, that it's like uh, a drug and it actually does change your behavior or whatever. I can't imagine life without coffee, but I do think it would be fun to maybe go without for a little while just to know how it affects my behavior. And, and maybe I don't need to quite have so much. I, there are lots of arguments for um, why not to drink too much coffee or to even cut it out, you know, for health reasons or whatever. But I don't know. It's like one of those things like milk, right? Like they, every, every year or two new studies come out saying it's good and it's bad, you know, and you just had to pick a side and like, you don't really, it can be both at the same time is my opinion for different reasons. Anyway, I keep going down rabbit holes, reinventing the burger. The Beyond Meat story. So this is going to highlight Beyond Meat. I think everybody knows about that company now. In 2010, a young Kleiner partner named Amal Deshpande, I don't know if I said that right, I'm sorry if I didn't, alert to reports of global food shortages, began looking into technologies that could use plant proteins to replicate the texture and flavor of meat. Later that year, around the time I began to grasp the magnitude of cattle emissions, Amal escorted a giant of a man named Ethan Brown into our office for a presentation. Standing six foot five in jeans and a t-shirt, Ethan made a powerful impression. More than anything else, I was blown away, away by his vision for a plant-based McDonald's and his passion for making an all-natural plant-based burger that could compete on taste with the real thing. That's awesome. And now I see that all the time over at Burger King, right? I guess they didn't open their own chain. I think. I don't know. Maybe I got the wrong company here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ethan Brown. I was raised in Washington, D.C. and College Park, Maryland. I guess I should maximize this where my father was a professor at the University of Maryland. Not being one for city life, my dad spent as much time as he could on a farm we owned in the mountains of Maryland. Though he bought, bought it for recreation and con conservation purposes, being entrepreneurial himself, we soon had a hundred head of Holstein cattle and a milk operation. As a child, I was fascinated by the animals around us, whether in our home, the barn, or streams, or woods. My earliest career ambitions were to be a vegetarian, a veterinarian. I grew up eating meat and at my size, probably more than most. One of my favorite fast food items was the double R bar burger with ham and cheese at Roy Rogers. As I got older, reflecting on time spent on our farm, I found it more difficult to dissociate the products, ham, cheese, and beef from the animals from which they came. Fast forward to my early twenties. I was sitting with my father in his office at the University of Maryland and discuss discussing my career path. He asked me an important question. What's the most important problem in the world? I thought it must be climate change. If the climate collapsed, nothing else mattered. 
I just want to take a minute to see if that's true, to just think in my head. Because immediately in my head, the first thing that popped up wasn't actually climate change, <laughs> which is really weird because honestly, it's a pretty fucking big problem if you ask me. But um, plastic, I don't know why I have it in my head all the time that plastic is like evil. It's like literally killing everything around us. It's, it's not, I know that the climate, it, like he has a point, it tr probably does trump everything else. But I feel like plastic might be a big, like, under... It's, it's a problem that, that seems, on the face of it, very easy to fix because we produce it so we can stop. But also, we rely on it so much. How would you do that? I don't know. I know that all these fancy labs make plastic-like products that might you know, one day be able to replace it. But at this point, they're so expensive and the, all the other alternatives. I don't know. I feel like, mm, what, what is that saying? Um, necessity is the mother of invention. Well, we don't really have a necessity because nobody's telling these fuckers to stop producing plastic because everybody's using it. There's no way to get around it. Our, I mean, our whole lives are plastic now. Even the clothes you wear are plastic. Every single thing. I bet, I bet if you look around you right now, you'll see something plastic. You might, know, you might not know it's plastic, but it's plastic. Anyway, it seems like almost as big a problem just because it's there forever, which seems like a good thing to us. But when it breaks down into tinier pieces and eventually gets to the ecosystem and to the things you eat and then it gets into you, it's probably not the best idea in the world. Anyway, that's a separate issue. It's a big one to me. Anyway. Moving on. And, and so after finishing school and a stint working overseas, I narrowed my focus to clean energy and service to climate. I progressed quickly in the field, got married, had children, a mortgage, and then two things happened. One, by my early 30s, my discomfort intensified as I realized that the food system that my kids were growing up with was largely unchanged and they would face the same dilemmas and narrow choices I had. Two, my personal interest in animals and agriculture and a career focused on energy and climate started to merge. Specifically, I can recall attending clean tech conferences where thousands of professionals would come together to discuss how to increase the efficiency and density of a fuel cell or lithium ion battery and then go out for a steak dinner. Having learned of vast emissions associated with livestock, I couldn't help but think that a massive solution was waiting, awaiting us right there on the plate. This guy's amazing. I just have to say I'm inspired by him. By my late 20s, my diet was fully plant-based. In my mind, the earliest iteration of what is now Beyond Meat was a plant-based McDonald's. As I soon realized, however, what we needed more was a venue, uh, more than a venue, were better products. Yes. And to get better products, we couldn't think about meat substitutes as a culinary exercise. We needed to apply science and technology and big budgets, what I had seen in the energy sector, and get away from alternatives and substitutes. We needed to go toward building meat itself directly from plants, plant-based meat. For me, a real breakthrough occurred when I stopped thinking about and defining meat in terms of its animal origin, but instead in terms of its composition. At a very high level, meat is really five things. Amino acids, lipids, that means fats, small amounts of carbohydrates, trace minerals, and of course, water. The, animals eat, the animal eats plants and turns them into muscle tissue, or what we call meat. Well, that's what Westerners call meat. There's all different kinds of meat, isn't there? Organ meat, all, yeah, anyway. But with today's technology, instead of using a biological bioreactor animal, we can harvest those core inputs directly from plants themselves we can use other systems to assemble them in the familiar architecture of meat. <laughs> he called an animal biological bioreactor. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
I've never thought of it in such a scientific manner before. I guess that's what they are. <laughs> I began to look around the globe for technologies that could be part of the solution. I ultimately found two researchers at the University of Missouri who were working on a method to break the bonds in, wit in plant protein and restitch the proteins into striated structure of muscle. In 2009, the year I founded the company, I called them and introduced myself, and thankfully they agreed over time to partner with me. I then reached out to the University of Maryland for additional research support. Between the two universities over several years, we were able to get a viable prototype. By the time Ethan shared his vision with us at Kleiner, he'd raised money from family and friends for an experimental kitchen in an old hospital building. As I came to know him, Oops, I found Ethan to be one of the most authentic people I'd ever met. He was committed to giving people what they love, the experience of grilling and tasting meat, but with peas and lentils and seed oils, subbing for animals. He chose the most sustainable crops and pulled out their proteins to create the biochemical essence of beef. No cow required. While Ethan may have, might have looked like a latter-day hippie, he had a second business plan backed by science and consumer taste testing. Plus, we loved the name, Beyond Meat. Kleiner Perkins became the first big investor in Ethan's fledgling company. Ethan Brown. The years went by with ups and downs. I'd put in something like $250,000 of my own money but we needed millions to turn Beyond Meat into something real. The team at Kleiner stuck their necks out for us. Once they got involved, others came aboard and we really started to move. Though we had brought a, a beef product to market in late 2009, it wasn't until 2012 that we offered customers what I then considered to be a breakthrough in muscle structure and sensory experience, our plant-based chicken strips. Whole Foods sold them in their prepared food section to, to great fanfare, including a feature article by Mark Bittman. Ooh, I, I had to write down his name because I used to have a cookbook by him and I couldn't remember his name and now I can find it again. It was called How to Cook Everything and it was very good. Okay, on the cover of the Sunday Review of the New York Times, complete with an artist's sketch of a chicken with broccoli for a head. It was a great moment for us. In 2016, we launched the Beyond Burger in the meat case right next to the beef from cows, first at Whole Foods and then throughout the nation, and now globally. Made from all natural ingredients and presented in raw form for the consumer to cook, this product was our breakthrough. Even today, as we go to market with our 3.0 version, we have miles to travel before we close the gap between the Beyond Burger and our other products, and their animal protein equivalent. We're getting there with our Beyond Meat Rapid and Relentless Innovation Program. The good news is that we don't see a material obstacle to someday achieving that perfect, indistinguishable build. Interesting. That's a whole philosophical conversation that I don't even feel ready to, to touch with a 10-foot pole. Like I just, it's a very, um, it's like a hot-button topic, isn't it? the philosophy of whether you're going to replace all the meat that you eat with, with meat that's like built in a lab or not. It's interesting. In 2009 or 19, we reached another massive milestone. McDonald's began testing a burger we developed for them in a small number of stores in Western Ontario, Canada. Late one evening after meetings in Toronto, I had the opportunity to drive a couple hours to the stores, walk in and eat our product. It was delicious, and I savored the entire experience. Out in the parking lot, I felt both immense gratitude and a sense of relief. What began as a dream is now was now our reality. Growing meant we needed more capital. It was time to take the company public. Our public offering in May 2019 took everyone by surprise, including me. We opened at more than double the offer price and the stock quadrupled in value over the next few months. Suddenly, everyone knew about Beyond Meat. 
Our ancestors began consuming meat from animals over two million years ago. This dietary choice, and later the discovery of fire for cooking, delivered higher nutrient density. It was like finding a cliff bar on the savanna versus consuming high volumes of grasses and other plants and having like several stomachs, right? No longer needing to process so much material, our stomachs shrank. Energy was freed up to power our ancestors' rapidly growing brain, which doubled in size. Yeah, we were always scavengers and we only ate a little meat. We probably ate lots of vegetables and fruits and stuff too to make up for it and nuts as well. But it's true. Meat really allows us, being an omnivore allows us to do so many things. It, it really just changed humans. And then the hunting to get, I'm sorry, this is like, I can't help but think about the fact that maybe hunting also made our brains bigger because we had to work together to bring down the large megafauna. So, you know, we needed to communicate and that is the magic of humans. All of this symbology that we use called language and all of these, you know, other animals have language too. They don't use as many words, you know, to say what they need to say to each other. And it's probably more limited in what they, you know, maybe they don't have abstract ideas like human constructs you know like we are we make stories our all our words create stories each sentence is a story we tell each other an agreement anyway um i think hunting gave us this magic at least it contributed maybe because that would be the most important thing to get food and if you need help to get food and the food is very clever and you have to be more clever than the food and you have to work together. Well, I guess there's a lot of other animals that do that without words, but they use body language. Our vocal cords turned out to be the, the best thing for us to be able to do that for whatever reason. It's such an interesting topic. I really want to delve deeper into it. But obviously it's not related to this, so <laughs> it's fine. Anyway, um, moving on. Doubled their ans my, our ancestors rapidly growing brain, which doubled in size. Today, we can use that brain power and technology to separate meat from animals and realize the attendant benefits, realize the attendant benefits to our health, the climate, natural resources, and animal welfare for ourselves and future generations. That seems like change at an evolutionary level, and it's endlessly energizing to my colleagues and me. Beyond Meat is aiming for price parity with beef burgers by 2024. Beyond Meat has surpassed 118,000 points of distribution in over 80 countries, including the vast China market. It has signed strategic global agreements with McDonald's and Yum, two of the world's largest restaurant brands. So am I thinking of a different company that did the burger at Burger King, the one that has no meat in it. Hold on. I think it's called the Impossible Burger. Is the Impossible Burger from Beyond Meat? Or is it a different company probably, huh? Okay, so they're, they are different. Impossible Foods. Okay, so actually that one was made largely of soy protein concentrate. That actually makes me want to puke. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't think I can eat that again. Soy protein is not, I don't, I think I was reading about that in, um, in a book about how bad that is, isn't it? It's like not the same thing as the whole soy. It's like some kind of byproduct or something. I don't know. I'm not going to say that. Just forget I said that. I don't know if it's bad for you. or It's probably not bad for you. It's just like, I'm like one of these people that don't eat, I don't like to eat additives and all this. And there's a lot of soy additives that are kind of gross in my opinion. And I, I don't know enough to say whether, whether that's one of them, but anyway, that doesn't, I, I think the other one beyond me, maybe I haven't tried that one. The beyond meat burger.
So I guess is where is it? Where is it served? Is it, is it its own chain yet? A chain. Many grocery stores and restaurants. Okay, well, maybe they don't have their own chain after all. Maybe you never got around to that part yet. Okay, that's interesting. Um, okay. But that's only the start. A recent customer study shows that more than 90% of plant-based burger customers are neither vegan nor vegetarian. Wow, that's cool. The broader market confirms the staying power of plant-based meat. The category grew to 45% year over year in 2020. The growth curve is showing no signs of flattening. Beyond Meat's new target, price parity with beef by 2024. I wonder if they're on target for that then. Because uh, like that's a month from now. So it's not even, it's three days from now. Um, I bet they're not gonna, they it, it still look pretty expensive to me, but 13 bucks or something. Let's see. Is Beyond Meat Burger more, is it more expensive than beef? Okay. Okay, so it's maybe twice as expensive still. Well, they're working on it. Oops. Ethan Brown is a climate crusader who has persevered in a highly competitive industry. Beyond Meat is going head to head with Impossible Foods, which I could have just read this instead of looking it up, which makes its own burger with heme, a blood like molecule derived from soy. In 2019, Burger King started selling Impossible Whopper worldwide. And it didn't taste that bad. That's my, that I added that. It didn't taste that bad. It tasted kind of normal. They were joined that year by Tyson Foods, which came out with chicken-like nuggets made out of pea protein. Rather than buck the trend, the largest U.S. meat producer was choosing to fight for market share. Plant-based proteins have captured nearly 3% of the packaged meat market, about where plant-based milk was 10 years ago. Cultured meats, also known as synthetic, lab-grown, or cell-based meats, are another future facet of the alternative proteins market. After biopsies of an animal's muscle, fat, and connective tissue, cells are cultivated in a nu nutrient-rich serum. While synthetic meats are not vegan or vegetarian, and are still priced higher than the natural variety, their production has the potential to cut emissions. Uma Velati a Mayo Clinic cardiologist and CEO and co-founder of Upside Foods says their self-renewing cell technology could entirely remove the animal from the meat production process. Okay, well that's all I'm going to read today. That is a very, I, I feel like I learned a lot and I'm very interested in this subject. There's like a lot of things for me that are kind of contentious. I just... I like the fact that, you know, no animals are dying and you're getting what you need for energy. That part is really amazing. And aside from the whole carbon thing, which is obviously super important because like they said at the beginning of this, what's going to matter if, if the planet gets too hot, like everything dies and everything is going to fail. And well, maybe not everything, but us more, you know, like planet earth will come back, but I don't know about us. But um, I feel like eating 
synthetic foods. I mean, I'm like one of these people. I, I eat whole foods as much as I can. I don't know. if I guess I would do that. There are clearly some upsides. If it can be proven to be safe, which I suppose it already has. But I prefer to eat mostly plants and just eat a tiny bit of meat and eat and hopefully know where that meat comes from most of the time. So I won't, I won't like not eat it. I'll probably try it even, and maybe I'll even buy it once in a while. I don't know. Um, it's interesting and, it, and it's necessary. And I, and I hope that we can really figure this out. The whole beef problem that seems like it's mostly beef, isn't it? Like with the methane problem with, for, from the food category. Anyway, it was really fun. Thank you for joining me. If you have any questions or comments, I'm on Twitter, as you can see. And probably soon, maybe I'll do, I'll like actually be on somewhere else, maybe. We'll see. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your, I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see you next week. Cheers.